explorers, and welcome to Reach the World's Explorer program. For 25 years, Reach the World has inspired youth to become curious, confident, and compassionate global citizens through virtual exchange. My name is Tim, and as always, I'm very glad you're joining us for today's live stream event. For the past several weeks, we have been learning all about cheetahs and Namibia, and as a further highlight of this virtual exchange, Today, we're traveling virtually to Cheetah Conservation Fund's Visitor Center in Namibia to meet one of the world's top experts on cheetahs, Dr. Lori Marker. You've been building up questions about cheetahs and cheetah conservation, and today's your big chance to ask them directly to Dr. Marker herself. Special thanks to the Infinite Safari Foundation for their generous support in making this global education experience free for all K-12 classrooms. I wanna give a warm welcome to many educators and students who are joining us live from around the world today, or maybe watching this recording after the fact. I'm gonna give, give a quick shout out to a few of those schools. We've got Stony Lane School, George White Middle School, Park Avenue Memorial, Perry Lecompton Middle School, Northside in Mississippi, Quaker Ridge School, East Carter High School, Smith Magnet School, Evergreen Elementary, Arthur Schomburg Elementary, Toluca Lake Elementary, Cool School Canada, Biotech High School, Homeschool Community in Massachusetts, the Julian Charter School, Saltbrook School, Lurie Elementary School in Virginia, Murdoch Elementary, Aquinas International Academy, and I know we even have some students today who are homesick from school but didn't want to miss this event, so we hope you feel better, and thank you all for joining. Finally, for those of you who are tuning in via YouTube, please use the YouTube chat bar to let us know you're here, where you're joining from, and of course, to share any questions you have for Dr. Marker as we go today. We'll get to as many questions as we can in the next 45 minutes. And without any further delay, it is time to travel virtually to Namibia in Southern Africa and welcome Cheetah Conservation Fund's founder and executive director, Dr. Lori Marker. Hi, Dr. Marker. Hello, hello everybody. <laughs> well, I like cheetahs a lot, and I hear you all do too, but I think I had a dog on my lap right there. What do you think? It is fantastic to have you here and to be able to join you, uh, join with you and talk with you today. Uh, I'm excited to learn about your, your visitor that you had uh, on your lap just a moment ago. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you tell us. And it just are. started raining. And thanks for braving the rain uh, today to join us. All right, let's give it a minute for the connection to come back. It always does. Is it still rainy? Mm. Yeah. Can you hear me, Dr. Marker? Hi, I can hear you. All right, fantastic. I'm going to turn it over to you to introduce yourself. Okay, great. I'm um, Dr. Lori Marker, and I'm the founder and executive director of the Cheetah Conservation Fund. And you're here with me in Namibia, Africa, at the Cheetah Conservation Fund headquarters, our research and education center. And um, just a couple of minutes ago, it started raining. So we had a really nice background over there, but we had to come out of the rain. Now, we're really, we like rain because here in Namibia, it's a very, very arid, arid country. And we very seldom get rain, except of course, right now today. So I wanna thank all of you students for wishing rain our way. I'm not sure if you did, but thank you. <laughs> Well, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we have a lot of students who are really interested in cheetahs, and I know that you are too, obviously. Can you tell us how you got interested in cheetahs and how you have sort of your career and your life path has made you so uh, connected to cheetahs and their, their well-being? Well, absolutely. And I don't know if you can see any cheetahs back there behind me. Can you see any cheetahs there? I can't see any cheetahs hmm. right now, but maybe they'll come a little closer to the fence during the course of our okay. conversation. That's just fine. <clears throat> well, I started working with cheetahs a very long time ago when I was about 19 years old. And I was working at a wildlife park in Oregon. And we were one of the few places in the world that had cheetahs. And I was fascinated with them and I wanted to know all about them. And 
one of my challenges to teach people around the world how special cheetahs are. Now, you all might know that the cheetah is the fastest land animal, but it's also an endangered species. As a matter of fact, it's Africa's most endangered species, and there's only about 7,000 cheetahs left in the world. But Namibia, where I am, is the cheetah capital of the world. We have maybe 1,500 cheetahs out of the world population. And here we spend our time working to keep cheetahs living free and in the wild. Most of the cheetahs are not found in protected areas. Most of them are actually found outside of protected areas on private lands where they're then in conflict with people and their livestock. So here in Namibia, we are, and throughout all of Africa, there's lots of livestock. There's goats and sheep and cattle and camels. And cheetahs and other predators can catch the, um, the livestock. And so with that, people don't like that. So it's called human wildlife conflict, where people then oftentimes want to kill the predators. So what we try to do is we try to uh, work together with the communities um, school children as well, farmers, to teach them that they can live in harmony with the cheetah through some programs that we have, like a Future Farmer of Africa program, our Future Conservationists of Africa, which are student programs. But another program that we have is also our Livestock Guarding Dog program. And I think that you learned a little bit about stock guarding dogs or some We'll give the connection a minute to catch up with Dr. Marker. Oh, hey, Dr. Marker, you paused for a moment, but you're back. You're, you're here with one of your livestock guarding dogs. Yes, indeed. This is Bolt. And Bolt, actually, uh, you might, you know, there's a man named Bolt, who he's named after, who's one of the fastest men in the world. And Bolt is one of our livestock guarding dogs. And he's a very big boy. Um, he's actually been the father of a lot of our, our livestock guarding dogs that go out and work to protect cheetahs. So these big dogs actually live with the goats and the sheep or the calves. And what they do is they protect the livestock by barking loudly. And they bond very closely to that livestock. And by barking loudly, the predators stay away. Now, cheetahs are not an aggressive big cat. They want to run away from anything. They can't get hurt. Predators don't want to eat your livestock. No predators do. A lot of it has to do with wanting an easy, quick meal, and that's why so often farmers don't know that, and they don't protect their livestock in such a way that predators can't get them. So that's a lot of what we do here, is we teach farmers that they can live in harmony with cheetahs, other predators, and wildlife. Because wildlife in Africa is um, really a very important part of Africa. And our wildlife is so beautiful, not only the cheetahs, but we have things like leopards and elephants and rhinos and all kinds of antelope. And so all of these are part of this whole ecosystem. And an animal like the cheetah, which is a top predator, plays a very key role in maintaining the health of these ecosystems. So I'm going to let Bolt go away now, I think. And that's Simone and Simone. Bolt. Say hi, Simone. Hi. Thanks for Simona is actually one of our students from Ochibarongo, but she now works for us to help take care of our dogs and our goats to help save cheetahs. Okay. Right. So Bolt it was wonderful to meet Bolt. Uh, glad that he could join us. Uh, Dr. Um, Marco, it, we... I also have some cheetahs here, and I don't know oh, if you can fantastic. see them. Yes. Because it is raining and we're trying to, there you go. I think you can see the cheetahs there. Line yes. down. Yes, we can see them, yes. Okay, those are two of our orphan cheetahs. They've been with us now, they're about 13 years old. That is Sine and I think it's Peter. And the other one, there should be a third one in there and her name is Tiger Lily. It's kind of funny because people say, why did you name a cheetah a tiger? Well, because a lot of people, well, when she was a little cub, when she came out, she looked and acted a lot like a tiger. She just didn't want to be um, orphaned from her mother. And um, so I said, well, you're a tiger, but you can't be a tiger. So I think Tiger Lily is prettier. But the other thing is, is many people don't even know that tigers don't live here in Africa. 
So some people come here and they go, oh, where are your tigers? It's like, well, we don't have any. And so she's also part of our education program as well to tell people a little bit more about the fact that cheetahs live here, lions and tigers, tigers do not live here. So um, cheetahs. And I want to know what all you are interested in learning about. Um, cheetahs are living in very, very large areas, like somewhere up to 800 square miles in what a home range is. We follow cheetahs through radio collars and track where they live and how they live. And then uh, we do a lot of other aspects of research here at our center as well. Like we understand their genetics and their overall health of the the diseases that they might have. Um, and then just understanding how, how beautiful they are. Um, those animals that have been orphaned, we take care of them. And so here at the Cheetah Conservation Fund in Namibia, uh, we have about 27 cheetahs that live here that are permanent residents. And they came because their mothers had been killed. And then the Ministry of Environment and Tourism bring the cubs to us and we work very closely with our government to make sure that these animals are well cared for. All right, um, wonderful. We, we, I feel lucky that we got to see some cheetahs. We didn't know if they were gonna be uh, coming over to see you today or to be by the fence. Uh, that's fantastic. I wanted to, I wanna share a, a video actually that we have of a cheetah, of adult cheetah running and maybe you can tell us uh, what we're looking at here. Oh, well, absolutely, me, me watching it. a cheetah That's run. The end. Okay, here we go. It's a slow motion video. Oh, isn't that wonderful? And if you notice when they're running, when the cheetah runs, they um, only one foot touches the ground at any point. And there's two points in their stride where they're actually flying through the air, where they're all the way stretched out and then doubled up. And you know, cheetahs are so special because they have what I would call dog-like claws, and their claws are always out, which is called semi-non-retractable, like uh, most cats all have. All other cats have retractable claws, but their claws are used like cleats for traction and running. And if you look at them also when they run, their body is just very flexible. That backbone is very flexible, and the tail acts like a rudder for balance, so they don't roll over and spin out when they're going so fast. So they're very, very amazing as they run. They are the fastest land animal, but they're an only a sprinter and they can only go fast for very short distances. Um, so they, they can't, they're not a long distance runner at all. Not like you seen Bolt, who you just met our dog Bolt, and he would be a long distance runner, unlike a sprinter. Okay, in, in the run up to this uh, going live, we asked in the chat what a group of cheetahs is called. Do cheetahs like to hang out with other cheetahs? And if so, what are they called when they all get together? Well, they are, they do to some extent. Male cheetahs live their whole life together and they're brothers, they're called coalition. So a, a group of male cheetahs that are living together is a coalition. And that allows them to hold a stronger territory, a better territory where there might be more prey. And with that, if they have a better territory, then female cheetahs would come into their territory more often. And if they come in, that means that the males could hopefully um, breed with those females, thus allowing their genes to spread further out within the populations. So that's really what territoriality is all about as well as um, a coalition of cheetahs. Female cheetahs live on their own, except with their cubs. And so really they're with their cubs, they're pretty much their whole life. So a female will live with her cubs until they're about 18 months of age. And then she will usually rebreed during that period of time. And as her 18 to 20 month old cubs go away, she now has a new litter of cubs to be born. So the cycle of cheetahs is um, is that way. And so they are more social. At one point, everyone called them a non-social carnivore, but they are very actually social. And they, within their home ranges, for instance, it's called a matriarchal home range, different than all the other large carnivores where um, the males usually cover multiple females' home ranges, where the cheetahs actually cover the female cheetahs cover multiple male home ranges. And from that, female cheetahs actually have 
make choice in how they um, how they pick their partner, and they will rebreed with that male if they can every couple years when they're cycling again. All right, fascinating. We have uh, a bunch of classrooms who are joining us live from different places uh, across largely North America, but also I see Namibia, the United Kingdom, and other countries outside of the United States. Um, and there's uh, a few classes that have to leave us a little sooner than others. So I want to give them the chance to come on screen and ask you a question if there are uh, some brave question answers. We're going to start with Perry LeCompton School. Hello, Perry LeCompton School. Hi. How are you? I see your, your virtual exchange flag flying in the background. It looks great. All right. We have a, a brave student who's ready to step up to the camera and ask Dr. Marker his question. Go ahead whenever you're ready. Have you ever had a cheetah lunge at you through the fence? Oh, yes. Cheetahs do lunge at people through the fence. Um, so that is something that is probably fairly common. Most of the cheetahs that live with us here are animals that are orphaned animals. And many of them I've raised from the time they were tiny cubs. And so instead of lunging at me through the fence, they usually come up and they purr to me. Now you might know that cheetahs are the only big cat that purrs, but they have other really interesting vocalizations. They chirp like a bird, a very high pitched chirp. And that's how they call their cubs. And they have a bubble. And they also, um, they can growl as well. But their high pitched cheetah like chirp is very, very, very um, unique. That is a great question. I actually have a video of a cheetah chirping that I can bring up. Let's, let's take Thank a listen. You. Good. Is that, is that the chirp we're talking about? That was a purr that I heard in there, actually. That's so cute. That's a purr. It's a, yeah, it's a gentle purr. Maybe not, maybe not the chirp we're talking about, but uh, you can hear the A chirp, I'll tell purr. you. Yeah, a chirp goes like. All and right. I think my cheetah's back here are going, what's going on? <laughs> Uh, Perry LeCompton, do we have any other uh, students who want to ask a question? All right, let's get someone else up on the camera. Thanks for being brave. Go ahead. Hello, I'm Mason. Um, um, so the cheetahs um, that were in the videos, how old were they? That cheetah that I just saw that was purring to us was maybe about five months of age. And the one that was running, I think, was one of our adult cheetahs. Probably that looked like a female that was running. And I um, would think that she's probably about three or four years of age. Cheetahs at full size here in Namibia are about bigger than a, um, than a German Shepherd, about a Great Dane size. Of, but then they weigh more than a Great Dane, and they're much faster. All right, thank you for that great, great question. Uh, Perry LeCompton, I will move you backstage. Um, there was one other class backstage that had to leave early. If you could send me a, a note in the chat uh, through StreamYard and let me know who you are, I'll, I'll bring you back on camera. Um, we have one more uh, video, uh, Dr. Marker, that I'd love to take a look at. Um, we, everybody wanted to see some cheetah cubs because they're so cute. And I have a video here to show and maybe you can tell us what we're looking at. <clears throat> oh. Well, those are very cute. If you can hear me. I can. Okay, those cubs are actually cubs that have come in from the illegal wildlife pet trade. Um, they have been confiscated. They've been taken from the wild. Um, and we take care of little cubs like this. We have another facility up in the um, north, the Horn of Africa, in Somaliland, where we take care of orphaned cubs. Um, but we try to work with people to keep these cubs to live free and in the wild, because they'd much rather be out in the wild than they would be under our care. But if they are under our care, we have a lot of work to do from a veterinary standpoint, making sure that they have the right nutrition and the right food so that they can grow up and be healthy and well. But unfortunately, 
if they are cubs at this size, then they're not able to go back out into the wild. And our wild animals play a very important role in making sure that our ecosystems stay healthy. They're a top predator. And with that, the cheetah is very special because it feeds all of the other smaller mammals, birds, insects. And then those animals are all fed. And that means that the biodiversity within the health of an ecosystem is much healthier. So please, although these are cute, animals never want to have an animal like this as a pet keep wild animals in the wild and help people like us or organizations like ourselves the cheetah conservation fund to help keep the animals living free and in the wild and a lot of that is around education and so you with in the schools that you're at are very lucky that you get to learn about all these wild animals and all the things that you get to learn about. But please, when you're looking at wild animals, help us keep them living free and in the wild by sharing with people that they do not make good pets. All right, that is a great, great lesson. I think everyone's natural reaction is, oh, they're so cute and they really are. Um, but the work being done by Cheetah Conservation Fund is very important in keeping cheetahs uh, in the wild as much as possible. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that soon. Uh, we have a bunch of other students who are ready to ask you questions. If you're ready, Dr. Marker. All ready. I'm happy. Very good. Well, I'm going to bring uh, Miss Ives. If you want to turn your camera on, I'll bring you on next. And then uh, let's start with the Stony Lane School. Hey, Stony Lane School. Hi. 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 Thanks for joining today. Do you, does some brave student have a question they would like to ask Dr. Marker? Come on up to the camera if you're, why don't you have your, your teacher pick? So he can see you. There you are. Okay. We are, wor we are worried about what you said about that cheetahs are endangered. Cheetahs, the one Thank you. I heard that. I appreciate you being concerned about the cheetahs being an endangered species. But you know, endangered species are animals that if we don't take care of them, they can go extinct like the dinosaur. But when they are endangered, that means they're in the hands of humans. And that means we are the ones that can decide if we're going to save a species or not. And I'd certainly like all of your help in saving the cheetah for your children. And if we're not really careful in what we're doing, and I don't get the help from all of you, your children may not be lucky enough to be able to see cheetahs. So I hope that you'll think about how you can help me save the cheetah. Thank you for that wonderful question, Stony Lane. We'll come back to you in just a minute. Uh, Miss Ives, hello, welcome. Um, I can't see your camera right now, but it's probably coming. I'm not sure why it's not working all of a sudden. We can hear you loud and clear. So if you want to have a student who wants to go ahead, please feel free. Perfect. Okay, Frank, why don't you ask your question? Uh, well, she just said my name. Um, what happens to the dog, uh, what happens when the to the guard dogs for the uh, livestock when they become old? Do they go back to the like the your place in Namibia, or do the farmers themselves take them in and care for them? Well, that's an excellent question. These dogs have been working for about 5,000 years, and they're very instinctual about what they do, and they love to work. And so when they've grown up with their livestock, even when they're really old, they usually stay out in the goat yard, and they'll, they, they still go out as much as they can. We find as they get older, they, they, they're a big dog, and they actually live to like 15 years of age. So as they get a little bit more feeble older on, Oftentimes they might stay back in the corral and then often the farmers will keep them with like the young kids or the long, young lambs. And so then we'll oftentimes get them a second dog that, that is out working. But um, very often, not very often do we take them back because they want to stay with their flock. Their flock is their family that they're an amazing breed of dog. Please read about livestock guarding dogs because the work that we've been doing here in um, Namibia for now over 25 years with the dogs has become very um, 
much used in many other parts of the world. In America now, they're actually learning much about the work that we've done to help protect um, livestock against wolves or, or mountain lions in South America and as well as in Europe. And it's fun that we've actually been doing this for such a long time that we're able to share all of our information with people to help them protect their livestock. It's an amazing breed of dog. Thank you so much, Dr. Marker. Great question, Frank. And if anyone wants to read more about the Livestock Guard program, there is a brand new article in the virtual exchange. Uh, I'm gonna put the link up on the screen here. You can check it out after today's event. You can learn more about what CCF is doing with the Livestock Guard program and setting what sounds like a standard for the use of dogs and conservation around the world. So fantastic question. Thank you for that. Um, I am going to bring up, let's see here, who, I see Mrs. Jordan's class is ready to go with a question. Hi, Mrs. Jordan's class. I'm going to turn it over to you. You go ahead. Hey, okay. You ready to ask your question or, okay. How did you train for your job and what school was needed? And that's, oh, well, that's a very good question. What grade are you in now? Second. Do you like animals? Yes. Good. Well, there's so many different things that one can study to take care of animals. So when I was young, I spent my time on a small backyard farm. I grew up on the back of a horse, and I still ride my horse every day that I can. But then I had goats. So I had a small dairy goat farm when I was young. And so that got me very interested. And then I did a lot of work in wildlife biology. And then I went into, um, into um, wildlife management and a, a lot in genetics. So I studied a lot of different aspects. I thought I was going to be a veterinarian when I was growing up, but I didn't have time, actually. So I ended up being a veterinary nurse or a technician. And then from that here in Namibia, I've been here now over 30 years, we have a registered veterinary clinic and we have a genetics laboratory. We have a wildlife biology team that goes out and does tracking of animals. We put camera traps up. And then we've got our dog program. We've got educators. So there's a variety of different kinds of work one can do to try to help take care of of wildlife. And so I think having a good science background is very important. So I hope you like science. Science makes a lot of sense and it's a lot of fun. So all you girls, please learn a lot about science and math if you can. Um, and then uh, from that, it's figuring out where you want to go to school and what you want to do. But there's a lot of different things that are needed today to try to help take care of wildlife. Awesome. Okay. Thank you for that wonderful question. I think you said your name was Emily, and we have another student ready to go. Wonderful. Go ahead. My name is Evie, and help I can cheetahs jump? That's a very good question. Well, cheetahs really aren't big jumpers. Cheetahs have that big stride that allows them to run fast, and oftentimes, um, if they do jump, and cheetahs do go into trees, but not like most cats do. They need to jump into a tree that is um, lowish to the ground, that has sort of a, a branch, a big thick branch that they can stand on. And they will um, actually go to a tree like that and go into it so they can see far. She just have very, very good eyesight. And they want to see what's going on out in the, the landscape. And when they're also in those trees, you know what they do? They also mark those trees. And they're called play trees or marking trees. And they mark the tree with their scat or poop. And we actually study scat here or poop. <laughs> but, so cheetahs don't, don't really climb or jump, but they, they can very carefully get into a tree, but not climb in, a, in the same way. They can't jump like a fence, um, like um, a mountain lion can jump like 20 feet high where a cheetah cannot, but a cheetah has a stride when it's running, which is about 20 feet. Thank you. Fantastic question, Ms. Jordan's class. We'll come back to you in just a minute. Thank you for those wonderful questions. 
Um, we have Palmer Public School with us today. Hey, Palmer. Uh, any students at Palmer brave enough to come on up and ask Dr. Marker a question today? You are, I'm, when you're ready, make sure you're ready. There you go. How old can cheetahs get? Well, cheetahs can live, if I said, if they, how long can they live? Their lifespan, their average lifespan in the wild might be about 12 years of age. Cheetahs can live to be about 18 to 20 years of age. Not very many of them make it that old. Um, our cheetahs here at the Cheetah Conservation Fund have long lives because we specialize in helping take care of them. So their lives are usually about 16 to 18 years of age. All right, fantastic question. Do we have another question from Palmer Public School while we're, while we're with you? I see some hands coming up, so you just have to go one at a time, please. How many cubs can a cheetah have at once? Well, their average litter size is four to five. There have been a few litters born of eight, which is very rare. And they usually don't have one single cub. If there are single cubs, they have a hard time taking care of them because the mother doesn't make enough milk. So four to five is usually the average amount. And you know, they're gestation, and that's the period of time when they've been bred till the time they give birth, is only about 95 days. And the little cubs are very, very small. They're about the size of, of what would fit into your hand. They're very tiny. Great question, Palmer. I'm going to come back to you in just a little bit. I want to bring in one question from the chat that I thought was very good. Uh, Ms. Gomez would like to know, and students would like to know, what colors cheetah can see, Dr. Marker? Well, that's great. Um, animals usually see in shades of gray. So they don't really see colors like we see. And, you know, there's been some fun, um, I think, studies shown like, what does a, uh, you know, what would a cheetah or a, a lion see when they're out in the, the veld seeing like zebras? Because zebras are black and white stripes and they blend in and all they see is things like gray. And so with that, that's part of the camouflage and it makes them blend in to the area that is around them. So they do not see the colors, but only shades of gray. And while we're talking about what they see, as I'd mentioned earlier, cheetahs have very great distance. And they can say, they can see, so they say, a couple miles without binoculars. So if you could imagine what that would be like if you were looking um, out that far, and then what it would be like if you put binoculars on. So they have very, very, very good vision. So when they hunt, their eyesight is very important to them. And then they stalk very closely, and then they get close, and then they go into a very fast, um, sprint and they have to catch their prey in a very short period of time because they can only go fast for a short time. And on another thing of the way they see, cheetahs do not see well at night. Um, and so they're a um, diurnal animal, which means they are hunting dawn and dusk, which is also the coolest part of the day. And I don't know if you know, another interesting part is how you tell the cheetah from all the other spotted cats. And that's because they've got those black tear marks which run down from their eyes. Those are called malar stripes. And they also are like um, sunglasses that we might wear, but they would also be very similar to putting black under your eyes if you're like a soccer or football player to help refract the sun's glare. So the cheetahs are pretty neat that they have built-in sunglasses that also those malar stripes help them because when they're hunting, when you're going 70 miles an hour, you can't really move your head back and forth and look at what's around. And so those, those malar stripes or their tear marks keep their eyes directly on the target that they are um, hunting, which is the prey that they are hunting. All right, fantastic. I saw a student in Miss Jordan's class waiting very patiently to ask you a question, Dr. Marker. So let's return to oh. her if she is ready to go oh. and she may she may that have was said not that. A, that was not a student in my class that was um oh. just another teacher all right no worries here. do we have another question you'd like to ask dr marker okay yeah. so corbin 
Hi, Corbin. Oh. Teachers can ask too. We were asking if how cheetahs get their markings. Yeah, how do they? Oh. Well, you know, they're born with their markings. But there's a lovely little story that is beautiful that talks about how the cheetah got its spots. But I don't know if we have enough time for it right now. Is that, is, is that available in the You book? can read more about it, too. Yeah, we've got a teacher's guide. And I don't know whether you're aware of the fact that we have a very good teacher's guide that we've developed for here in Namibia, and we work directly with our, our it's cross-curricular with our, um, our um, curriculum here, but it's available and can be used there for your schools as well. And in there, there is the story about how the cheetah got its spots. It's a Fantastic. fable, but it's still fun. Fantastic, we will so share much. that with our classrooms right after this call. So you can, he you can read about how the cheetah got its spots and all the other uh, cool, uh, educational tools that CCF has available. We'll share that right after we're done here today. But I should also say that they are born um, gray, smoky gray, because they grow into their spots. And so as they start growing, you see more and more of their spots. But the black spots are all in there and their, their black spots actually goes into their skin. And so the black pigmentation where the hair, uh, the black hair comes from is actually in their skin or in their hide. And even when they're born, they've got those little tear marks that are there and then they grow into their body and their spots. Fantastic question, Corbin. Thank you so much for being brave and asking Dr. Marker. I'm gonna to return to uh, Miss Ives class. I know they've got to leave pretty soon. Do we have any other questions for Miss Ives class? We do, Taylor has a question. How do you know if a hurt cheetah is in the area? Oh, we don't really know if a hurt sheet is in the area. Um, other than if it is very hurt, well, that I shouldn't say that, that it might then, if it can't hunt, it might go and try to catch livestock. And then if it does, then uh, a farmer might catch it. And that's when we would be oftentimes called. But what we have found um, that, Cheetahs really don't want to be near livestock. And so the only times that they really are what would be a problem animal is if there is something wrong with them. And we've seen things like broken teeth, broken legs, and then they actually come to humans to try to find food. And um, and then people think, oh, it's, it's going to be my, you're catching my livestock. But now so many of the farmers here have started learning more about the cheetahs and then they'll call us and then we can find out what's going on with that animal and help it. And you know, sometimes if it's got a broken tooth, we actually will take the cheetah to the dentist locally here. And the dentists in our town of Ochivarongo have worked very closely with us to take care of um, some of our animals. And if you could imagine what it's like to have a cheetah go to the dentist, think about that next time you go to the dentist and you might get a big chuckle out of it. The cheetah is put to sleep under anesthesia. So it's not a wild live awake cheetah. It is an animal that's gone through anesthesia. Thank you. Fantastic question. Do we have maybe, we have time for maybe one more from Miss Ives class before you go, if there is one. If not, that's okay. Sure, Alexa has a question. Um, is it common for the cheetahs you take in to have illnesses? And if so, what are some of the more popular ones? No, oh, well, that's a very good question. And actually, no, most of our cheetahs are very healthy here in Namibia. And oftentimes they're caught um, as a perceived threat to livestock. People see them and they, they catch them. And then with that, many times now, the farmers allow us to put a radio collar and put them back out into the wild. Up in Somaliland, where we work, where the cheetah cubs are coming in caught from the wild for the illegal wildlife pet trade, they oftentimes, as tiny babies, are under a huge amount of pressure and then they can be sickly. And sometimes this is around nutritional problems. They're not given the right food. 
um, and then they get diarrhea because they might not have the right milk. And then oftentimes cheetahs can catch many of the different cat viruses. And so if you have a cat, you would vaccinate your cat every year against these viruses. And cheetahs can catch all of those kinds of viruses that the domestic cat can get as well. Okay, thank great, you. Great question. I thought You're I welcome. heard the familiar sound of a, a period so. ending bell in the background. Oh, so thanks for joining us, Ms. Bye, Oz. kids. Class, we'll I hope you. you'll help us save cheetahs. Please all, all right, stay we involved. Have, let's, let's go back to uh, Palmer Public School. Do you have any more questions? We have about five more minutes that, with uh, Dr. Marker. Any other burning questions that you'd like to ask? I see some hands up. If, if uh, right. someone wants to come up to the camera, right. fantastic. Excuse me. And I hope yes. as you're coming up, remember that it's World Wildlife Weekend. So World Wildlife Day is on Sunday. And we're going to be celebrating it here in Namibia at our, with our schools in Ochivarongo tomorrow. So I hope everybody celebrates World Wildlife Day. What other animals are in the family of a cheetah? Well, there are, there are no other direct family cats or species within the cheetah's family. The cheetah's closest relative would be the mountain lion, also known as the cougar, or an animal called a jacarundi, which comes from South America. Those are its two closest relatives. But there are about 40, over 40, 42 kinds of cats. And the cheetah is the most unique because it doesn't have anything else in its family line. The other animals, cats are called like Panthera, which has all the other big cats, and Felis, which has the small cats. But the cheetah is from the family line called Asinonyx. Its scientific name is Asinonyx jubatus, and there is no other animal within that family line. So the 7,000 cheetahs that we have left in the world, that's all we've got. So we have to take very good care of them. All right, fantastic question. Thank you, Palmer. I'm going to do, Dr. Marker, just a real fast uh, run through a couple of questions that are in the chat. And then I want to finish by talking about how students and the audience today can help CCF and its mission in protecting cheetahs, even though they may not be uh, in Namibia or any place in the world uh, where there are cheetahs naturally in the wild. Um, Ms. Gomez, students would like to know how much an adult cheetah weighs. Our, so our cheetahs here in Namibia, an adult cheetah male would weigh maybe 100 to 110 pounds, and a female would weigh potentially about 75 to 80. And that is in the southern subspecies. There is a, um, there are what are called in subspecies, five different kinds of cheetahs or subspecies, although they're all genetically very similar. And up in the Horn of Africa, where we work in Somaliland, our cheetahs there are much smaller. And so a, an adult male might weigh only about 70 pounds and a female might only weigh about 50 pounds. All right. So there's quite a variation. Yeah, I'd say uh, we have another question. How do cheetahs get away from predators and what are their predators that came from Nora and Miss Jordan's class? They get away by running fast. So what cheetahs have is speed. Um, what they don't have is anything very powerful and aggressive. So they don't have big teeth. They don't have powerful, sharp claws. They've got the speed to try to get away from any dangers. Um, and their predators that would be a danger to them would be lions, hyenas, leopards, even baboons, and to cubs, even things like jackals or birds of prey could catch the little cubs as well. But the big predators are the lions, hyenas, um, and leopards. And that's why cheetahs don't live in protected game reserves. Those protected areas, those larger predators have taken over and the cheetah has moved out. And that's why they live on landscapes where there's people and oftentimes then their livestock 
And what we do is we try to work together to help grow wildlife in those areas so that there's plenty of prey for the cheetahs to also be able to hunt and not the livestock. All right, excellent. Now to sort of bring us to our conclusion here today, I'm gonna to bring Ms. Jordan's class and the Palmer Public School back on camera. Yeah. Um, we have a really great question. Bring the cheetahs from back on camera then. We have a really great question that's gonna be a great way to wrap this up. And it comes from Emmett in Ms. Jordan's class. Emmett would like to know what he can do as a second grader or what students can do generally to help cheetahs not get further endangered or help with the conservation of cheetahs, what can we do uh, to help? Well, that's, thank you. That's a lovely question because we need lots and lots of help. The cheetahs need a lot of help. What we wanna do is to help spread the word. So please tell everybody that you meet that you learned about cheetahs and that they need people's help. And another way might be to help us raise money to help keep our work going. That might be by, you could help sponsor one of our cheetahs that are living here at the Cheetah Conservation Fund. So if you go to our website, which is cheetah.org, you can learn all about sponsoring a cheetah. Maybe your school would wanna do that. And another thing is you could sponsor one of our livestock guarding dogs. So a farmer could actually get a dog to help protect their livestock. So help us raise some funds, help us tell the world that the cheetah needs help. Be a cheetah champion with us. And we'd love to have you a part of all of the work that we're doing. And I hope to meet you all, and I hope that you'll join us. You're also welcome to come and visit us here in Namibia and learn more about the work that we're doing. Maybe tell your family to come on a, a tour um, and visit us here in Africa as well, or when you're a little bit older. But those are some things that are easy that you could do and spread the word and, um, and maybe help us raise some funds to save cheetahs. Amazing, Dr. Marker. Thank you. It's time for us to say goodbye while we have our students on the camera. Students, can we give a good, big goodbye and thank you to Dr. Marker from thank joining you. us? Thank you so much. Bye. Students, I'm going to just show you a little bit more of our center here because Excellent. it's not raining now. So do come and visit us sometime, but go to our website and watch all of our YouTube videos and learn more about how you can join us and help save cheetahs. Fantastic. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today. This has been such a learning experience, uh, learning from Dr. Marker and seeing some cheetahs at the CCF uh, compound in Namibia. Thank you so much, Dr. Marker. Thank you to our entire YouTube live stream audience for joining us. Don't miss all the wonderful virtual exchange articles from Brian and Anaki on Reach the World's Cheetah Conservation in Namibia Journey homepage. I've added the link to the chat and please stay tuned for more of this journey together. We have much more to go, much more to learn about cheetahs and we're gonna work on some projects together to help Dr. Marker and help the Cheetah Conservation Fund uh, with this work. So join us for another virtual exchange live stream soon and goodbye everyone, thanks so much. Bye. 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 Bye.